Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. Welcome to Serena Live. We just keep on moving. I'm so glad it's the end of the week. So, so glad. Let me turn this around. Hello, peeps. How are you? I'm just going to fix myself. You know, I have a bad habit of kind of like seeing myself and then fixing myself as I see things. But what can I do? Thank you for joining Shan Jazz. I appreciate it. Don't know who you are, but tell me what your name is and where you're from. Thanks for joining. So, hey guys. It is Thursday night and it is Ask Sarina Light. Hey, Kimberly. I am excited to be here. I'm excited for the end of the week because this is my birthday week, people. It's my birthday week. We'll get into that in a second. So, this is Ask Serena Live. This is my weekly show that I do at 11 p.m. every Thursday where I talk about everything from the world of work to pop culture to whatever kind of sparks my interest for the week. I am Janine Truitt. I am the Chief Innovations Officer for Talent Think Innovations LLC based in Port Jefferson Station, New York. And my firm is a business strategy and management consulting firm that focuses on HR and talent management strategy, digital marketing strategy, brand influencing, executive coaching, and just overall advisement for tech and women-owned startups. So that's a little bit about me. And tonight, we're going to be discussing the role or the importance of the role of the uh, female role model. There's plenty of those and there's lots to be said about that and I've got a ton to say about it. So we will certainly t be talking about the importance of it and how it's kind of evolved over time because I think there's a shift in a bigger stage now. So we'll explore all of that. But as usual, there's always articles that inform the discussion. And so before I get too deep in my discussion, I wanna be sure that you have the articles so that you can check it out for yourself. So the articles I referenced this week are, uh, the first one is called, We All Need Role Models to Motivate and Inspire Us. And it's actually by Psychology Today, which I love um, because they just always have really quality articles. Um, and I thought it was a really good one because they really dove into um, the importance of having role models at every stage of life. And I think that's so important. Um, the other article is called The Effects of Celebrity Role Models on Kids and Teens. And that one was also good. Um, I think I wanted to touch on that because I talk a lot about parenting and being a mom. And so, you know, there's something to be said about the roles, um, the role models that are out there for children and how that kind of starts out. I mean, that's obviously the beginning of any kind of modeling that we experience as human beings. Um, the third one is called Pay It Forward, Role Models Show the Way for Inclusive Workplaces, and that's by Forbes, and that was also good. So that article kind of takes a look at role models in the workplace and um, specifically points to some of the bigger names that are actually doing a good job of it. Obviously, Facebook gets named along with um, a bunch of other tech startups, but it's a good article, so check it out. So role models, more specifically female role models. I mean, for me, female role models have been huge, huge. Um, and, you know, I think when we think about role models, we tend to think of it in terms of um, a public figure a politician, a philanthropist, somebody with some sort of notoriety. But I think the first role models we have to start with are the people that are in our family. So I know for me, I've had really, really great role models um, from a familial standpoint. My mom is a, a character, <laughs> a character in general. 
but a strong character also. I mean, she's just tough as nails. And so, you know, anybody that knows me or has been around me for long enough knows I have a bit of an edge to me at times. And that's from where that comes. It's that good stock. Like she just works extremely hard. Um, she's a hard worker. Thank you, Neil, your career. Thanks for joining. How are you? Um, she works extremely hard, ex like her whole life. And she doesn't take anybody's shit. She just doesn't. And so from young, she just kind of drilled into me this whole, you know, do what you have to do, you know, always do for yourself, always be independent, always have money in your pocket, don't depend. You know, men are great, men are nice. Nice, I know, I'm very excited that you are a new face on, so thank you so much. Um, you know, she's like, men are nice, but like, you're a woman, you're a young woman, you're going to be a grown woman someday, you need to have your own. And that stuck with me forever. And all her sisters, my grandmothers, I mean, just in different ways, all of them, just really good stock, really strong women. Um, and so for me, while I enjoy celebrities, some of them at least, not all of them, I enjoy celebrities, I enjoy public figures, but for me, I was always much more focused in on the women that immediately impacted me, and that's family. I really can't think of a person, um, a celebrity, that I ever felt like I wanted to model myself after. I mean, I think there are some great people out there and you know certainly as a teenager from a style perspective you know you kind of look at a little of this a little of that and you try to figure out yourself that way but I still just always come back to the people that immediately impacted me so that's me um, but like I just know that there are just so many young women um, that are just focused on celebrity they're focused on the fanfare of it they just love it and I know for me one of the things I found extremely disturbing is if you ever get a chance and you're on Instagram like take a moment sometimes to like follow like not follow legitimately but just like go on the comment section for some of these celebrities I've done this on nights when I've been legitimately bored and seeing these like really young girls, I mean, have to, if I had to guess, maybe like 12, 13, who are literally on these people's threads. I mean, let's just take one for instance, like a Beyonce for instance. And they're like, please notice me. I love you. Oh my God, I would die if you said anything to me. You know, like, please notice me. Please look at my artwork. Or um, I think you're so gorgeous. You're like perfect. Everything is Oh, you're perfect and you know you're you're like beyond flawless and I'm not you know and they say these things like on threads and it's so troubling to me because it's like they've put so much stock in these people not really realizing one that they're fallible I mean they're human beings just like you and I they're not perfect and like I don't even know that they're the most realistic um, example of what you should be. I mean, I think you can definitely take notes from celebrities and from public figures and there's things in that regard. And I mean, I'm not all telling people who they should honor, who they should like. Like, if that's what you're into, fine. But I just found it personally, as a woman and as a parent, I found it personally troubling that these young women are so it's almost like an obsession I guess that's the issue so it's one thing to um, enjoy what somebody does and it's a whole nother thing to just be obsessed like to actually be obsessed and to not think that you're worth anything close to this person like that's a problem and so you'll see like one if you go back to some of the articles especially the one about the effects of celebrity role models on kids and teens it pretty much nails it on the head in so far as like that whole thing is concerned. But um, I just think it's so, so important for
from a very young age for young women to have strong role models. And sometimes it's not always, they're not always as fortunate as I was. Like I said, I have a mother who is crazy awesome, you know, and I have a lot of other women in my family who are crazy awesome as well. And so I consider myself fortunate, but I also don't turn a blind eye to the fact that not everybody is that fortunate. And so like I said, it's so important for young girls to have good role, role models and some of them just don't. Like either their mother's not in the picture or mother died or you, you know, whatever the scenario is. And so I've always felt like, you know, people like myself who have reached a certain professional level in their career have a duty to seek out those young girls and to bring them up with them. And I think we don't do enough of that, um, quite frankly. We just don't. I mean, I've worked in a number of environments in which I was very often, hey, Lataria, very often one of the only people who would mentor other people, um, one of the only women in specific that would mentor others. And um, I think it's sad because it's such, hey girl, it's such an opportunity. It's an opportunity to mold the next generation, um, but it's also an opportunity to learn. Um, so in as much as like, I've always felt like I was imparting something on a younger person, I was also learning too, you know, like they were almost molding me in the reverse. So, you know, there's modeling, you know, from the top down, but I feel like there's modeling from the bottom up as well. And it's an important cycle, very, very important cycle. Um, and certainly once you establish a career and you enter, you know, whatever that niche is that you're gonna work in, it becomes even more important. Um, one, from being able to see somebody who's doing exactly what you wanna do, um, but also having somebody there who can advocate for you, huge. Um, and I wasn't always so fortunate. So whereas I was very fortunate in the personal department to have really great women to model myself after, in the workforce, I found myself very much lacking in finding good role models. Um, they just there just weren't a lot of people that I could identify with. And it didn't stop me from working at any given place. I just did what I had to do, but it certainly could have enhanced my experience and I think en enhanced my ability to climb the ladder wherever I was. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important, one, to see other females in leadership or in positions where you want to, because some everybody doesn't want to be in leadership, right? We speak a lot about women having to be in leadership and that's all fine, but like not everybody is cut out to be a leader and not everybody wants to go to leadership. I think you have to kind of have a good smattering of women at every level to actually speak to everybody and what they want to do. You know, like some people are good at the mid-level. Some people are good at being entry level and that's all they ever want to do and that's okay and you need to have good role models good mentors at all of those levels um but for me because I worked a lot in like healthcare, I worked a lot in STEM disciplines not only were there not a lot of women that I saw myself in but there weren't a lot of women just of color. <laughs> so there's two different things. It's actually having a woman, like I've always felt like I can learn from anybody, a man, woman, whatever. Um, and I have, and I have, and there's no issue with that. Um, but there is a certain level of comfort when you're able to find somebody that looks like you in the organization and you can latch on to them. And so, you know, there were a few instances in which I was able to do that and it was like, ha, huh, this is this is good, you know, and sometimes it wasn't. So, you know, here's the thing, like 
as far as the um, the racial aspect of it, is it nice to be able to see other women of color rise the ranks in your organization that you can latch onto? Absolutely. But I've always been very firm on it has to be the right person. So it's not just the color. Like I think a lot of companies are now doing the knee jerk thing and thinking, okay, well, we've got a diversity and inclusion issue. Let's just get a woman of color and throw them in there and it'll be fine. And it's not always fine because at the end of the day, people are people. They just are. And if you have the wrong person in the wrong position, and in this case, if you have the wrong mentors in place or the wrong role models in place, it does just as much damage as not having anybody at all. That's just been my experience. So, you know, I've had exposure to a lot of different people, whether they've been of color or not, and some have made me, you know, in, in the time that I've actually interacted with somebody that was of color and happened to be in leadership and there was a synergy, it was fantastic. And then sometimes there's no synergy and I don't see myself in this person at all. It actually happened to me in my last position. Had a, a woman of color in diversity, nice enough lady, I still stand by that. Um, but as time went on, I just realized she wasn't really there to advocate for me. And in fact, she wasn't as married to the things that I was married to. And we just had a really, really different way of operating. Now, it doesn't make her bad and me good or vice versa. It's just different. And so in that case, I would have taken anybody over her as a mentor um, just because we had such differences in approach. So it's not because she was a black woman and I happened to be a black woman that there was going to be synergy, but people assume that that's the case. And that's an unfortunate <laughs> realization. So, um, you know, I think that we're trying to make strides or I think some companies are trying to make strides, but I think they have to be mindful not to do the stereotypical things of trying to match people based on what they think is going to work. Um, whether it's based on you're LGBT or you are, you know, LGBT and LGBT or you're black woman, black woman, you know, that kind of thing. It doesn't really have to be matchy matchy. But at the same token, it does help for other people to see people like themselves moving up the ranks. And so, yes, you have to do that, but you have to make sure it's the right people. Um, and I've also discussed in the past, like, just my bouts of dealing with women and toxicity in the workplace. And that's a whole nother thing. So it's like, fine, great. You're putting women in leadership. You're putting women in roles. But like, again, are they the right women? Are they the right people for these jobs? I mean, it's a, it's a pretty substantial job position to be in to uh, be seen as a mentor or role model, right? I mean, it's a, a lot of your time for one. It takes a lot of your time to spend with somebody else trying to help them learn what you already know. So that's the first thing. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, you have to have somebody. Absolutely. The wrong woman can absolutely mess it up. You as a mentor, you almost have to, it's not at all about you being in the driver's seat. It's a very fine line. Like you have to, you know, almost be like a coach, like a coach. You know, you, you kind of put your two cents in there when you need to, but you kind of have to listen more than you speak. It will prove their theory about women not looking out. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, that for sure, you know, you are really much more of a coach than you are anything else. And you have to almost listen more than you speak because there's a very fine line. Like the, if you speak too much and the person that you're mentoring or you're supposed to be a role model for starts to get the gist that like somehow there's a difference of opinion, there's you can shut down the whole thing. The whole thing can be done from them. They shut down. They don't want to talk to you anymore. It's a done deal. 
So you have to be very careful to be in a position where like, yes, you're giving information, you're providing knowledge, but you're asking more questions to get them to think about things more so than you telling them what to do. That's really what it is. And, you know, I think a lot of people just don't get that right. It's absolutely that fine line between knowing when to coach and knowing when to cheer. And so, you know, those that's a very, very specific skill set. Like, you can't throw just anybody into that. You just, it's not going to work. Um, so, you know, there, there is probably some kind of training that needs to go on behind all of that. But, you know, the point of it all really is it's hard to be soft and strong. It is, it is, I, you know, I think one of the things that we all struggle with, like, I don't want to take myself out of it is that, you know, to be a leader, to be in that kind of position it's almost like we feel like we have to overcompensate to prove that we we have strength, that we're a strong leader, um, right? We just, it's an overcompensation and it's like it may not even be natural for us to react in that way or to act in that manner, but we tend to do that very often because we don't want anybody to think that they can step on us. They don't want, we don't want them to think that we're soft. And I think we have to learn to balance that a little better. I mean, you definitely don't want to see, have people see you squirm for sure. Um, but then at the same time, there's a certain aesthetic about a woman that has that softness, that, that delicate touch that is sometimes needed. Like sometimes that may be the one thing that breaks up the monotony of a lot of tension in the office or breaks up the, ten, you know, the monotony of, you know, politics or whatever. Like, I think that's what we bring to the table as women. We have to kind of embrace that. But to that end, people don't really want to see that either. So it's like in as much as you want to be as natural to what you know and what you are in the workplace, some of that stuff's frowned upon. I mean, take for instance, if something happens in the workforce and like you start crying for instance how does that look you know the second you start crying it's like oh well you know she's not emotionally stable and you know maybe she can't handle a position and maybe it's not any of that at all but that's the perception so i think we're still a long ways off from being able to truly yep it's, I think we're a long ways off from truly being able to balance it and from also shifting the perspective of how we should be in the workplace. I mean, there's just so many perceptions. There's perceptions of women in general, and then there's just perceptions as you start to look at the different subsets of women. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example. So there have been many instances in which I've been told that I was the angry black woman and you have no idea how this irks me and I don't understand the connotation and because literally it was being broken brought up to me about why I was acting like that because I was quiet so this is how I am in the workforce this is the honest to God truth I go to work you tell me what you need me to do I get it done I go to my cubicle, I go to my office, I'm quiet. Until I start to feel people out and understand like the dynamics of what's going on, I kind of just stick to myself. That's just how I am. And I'm an introvert and I've mentioned this before in other scopes. I'm up here a lot. Has absolutely nothing to do with anybody else. Doesn't mean I don't like you. It doesn't mean that I can't carry on a conversation or I wouldn't carry on a conversation. I'm just in my head a lot. And so I like to just get down to it and get it done. And so, you know, you'd have all these other people like, hey girl, oh, your shoes, that's cute. And you know, this kind of cutesy wootsy stuff. And hey, if that's your thing, cool, not mine. It's just not how I operate. I will certainly talk you up. Yes, I have a very direct communication approach. And so 
it's not at all like I can't have casual conversation. I'm just very focused on the result at work. And so once I've gotten the result, then I'm more than happy to socialize and all of that. Um, yes, me, the Letaria, but I'm not, I, I am not, nor will I ever be the woman who is in meetings, you know, doing one of these. Or, you know, complimenting on shoes before we discuss the actual deliverables. <laughs> I can't believe you laughing. No, seriously, I'm not that woman. I will never be that woman. I've been in meetings with women, high enough women in the organization, who have literally sat in a meeting with me and done this. All meeting. All meeting. So, like, oh my God, your shoes are amazing and that's fantastic and... And my face is like this. To the point where one of the higher ups in my previous position was like, is there an issue, Janine? I was like, no, no issue. And she's like, well, you make me nervous. And I said, well, I'm sorry that you feel that way. I said, I'm just waiting for the meeting to start. And I continued to watch. And then they started. So, you know, whatever rocks your world. But like, again, if we go back to the theme of role models and such, none of those women were anything that I aspired to be. Like, none at all. And what was interesting was the one that seemed to feel like I had the resting bitch face um, during our meeting was somebody that I was constantly being told I should really get up under her. You need to be near her. You need to be friendly with her. You need to be in her corner because if you're in her corner, you're going to go places. And I wasn't hearing it. I just couldn't see it. I'm like, I've seen how this woman operates in meetings. She flirts with the men to get what she wants. She twirls her hair. None of this is stuff that resonates with me. What is this woman going to do for me? Now, granted, she was the CFO. She did have a lot of clout. But for me, as the potential mentee, I just could not get with her getup. I couldn't get with it. And so I respected her for who she was, but she wasn't the ideal role model or um, mentor for me. And what's interesting is, you know, obviously I ended up leaving, but she also ended up screwing up big time and she ended up being shipped off to another place too. So it's, you know, here is a lesson, um, you know, just the same as somebody may be reaching back for you, just because they're reaching back for you doesn't mean it's ideal for you. You have a say in it as well. So if you're looking, they want us to fall down. Right. Exactly. And for me, integrity is huge. So her flirtation, her lack of acumen in things that I felt she should have had acumen in um, were deal breakers for me. And so I didn't see a role model in her. I just didn't. There were people many rungs down from her that I would have rathered as a mentor and a role model than her. Does it mean she's a horrible person? It just means she wasn't for me. And I think we do a disservice when we're trying to do that match, when we don't recognize that there are two people part being party to this whole kind of partnership or whatever, collaboration. It cannot be one way. It's not like, oh, let me give you this mentor. Here's your role model. Live with it. There has to be synergy. There just has to be synergy. And I just was never that impressed with her. Um, but, you know, herein lies where the politics comes into play. You know, if everybody thinks she's the woman that every woman should want to be, well then, by all means, how dare you? How dare you, Janine, reject being mentored by her? So you see where there's, like, issues with this kind of thing, you know? But you have every say in this whole situation you have the say. You have the final say. If you don't want that kind of mentor, I feel like you should not, you don't have to be rude about it, but I feel like you should be honest about that and be honest enough to say like, listen, these are the things I'm after. This is the kind of mentor I need. 
and I'm just not seeing those things with that. Right. And she was popular. I mean, hey, she was dating a few people on campus. She was she was a hot number, but I wasn't at work to be a hot number. I was at work to be a professional and to be somebody that brought something to the plate. And so, you know, seems casually after. Right. And that's the thing, might. And so I come back to this angry black woman thing. Like, I hope, I hope a lot of people watch this because just because, and I, I'm going to say this, and I know I'm speaking for a lot of women of color. Just because I don't want to converse with you every moment of the day, I am not an angry black woman. Just because I disagree with anything you have to say, I am not an angry black woman. Just because I've come to work to do the job you hired me to do does not make me an angry black woman. Okay, now, y'all heard it here first. I am not an angry black woman. I am just an angry woman. Right. Correct. I don't know anybody who's pleasant all the damn time. I don't know anybody. Not a one. Not a one. But I'd like to think I'm a pretty pleasant person, right? I am the kind of gal. We always got to be happy, always smiling. But guess what? The Harlem Renaissance has passed. This is not a minstrel dance. I don't tap for you because you want me to tap. I'm here to do a job. A job. Tell me what you need and I will do it. Yes. Yes. I just, you know, and it, it, the other thing too is when you have been in a lot of different environments and experienced things, you get a little gun shy. I know that's true of me. I just got gun shy. There were people that I trusted early on that I found out I couldn't really trust. And, you know, people were just kind of shady and doing things behind your back. Right. Exactly, Lataria. So I had just learned to slow my roll, for lack of better words. Slow my roll and just watch. I'm an observer. I don't jump in head first with people. I just don't. I like to sit back. I like to observe and see, you know, what is the lay of the land? How are you operating? That's kind of a smart way to be, I'd like to think. Not just watching has been. Yeah, just wa just watching people, you learn so much. Learn so much. And so I like to do that. And once I've observed then, then I'll start to see, you know, okay, this person's okay. I can kind of mesh with them. I can kind of mesh with this person. Very few have integrity, very. And that's the problem. And so that's why I've been saying, I mean, it, there's been several weeks of us talking about women's issues, but I would be so remiss to sit here and act as if we are not our own worst enemy sometimes. Like we really and truly are. I mean, there are a lot of things that are counting against us, a lot of elements against us that we have to still continue to fight for. But yes, oh my God, that's exactly it. Self-repressed at times, like we really are sometimes our own worst enemy. We just are, you know, it's like, I literally had a boss, I, I kid you not, that made my life a miserable hell. Hey, Kale, miserable hell for like nine months, literally. Here's why she made my life a miserable hell. The job that I was at had all of these, hey, the job that I was at had all of these um, like core management courses. So you were able to get these certifications at the job. Phenomenal. When I tell you I'm like such a geek, I'm a geek. And so when I got to this job and I realized like what? They're paying for certifications. You can just go on work time and further your education. I was all there for it. I'm like, I'm taking like six certifications. Meanwhile, I had just had my first child. 
I couldn't care less. I was like, look, when she goes to bed after I feed her, I'll study. I'll get it done. But I digress. So I, as I said, I went hard. Like they paid for these things. I didn't have to come out of my pocket with anything. It wasn't even a reimbursement situation. I went ahead within a year. I got five certifications. My media boss stopped talking to me. Why? Because she thought, drum roll please, that I wanted her job. Now she was the talent acquisition manager. No, talent acquisition director at that time. And the interesting thing about it is she was literally put in place to kind of mentor me. Role model. The problem with her actions is she bullied me every day for about six months. I mean, just throwing me unreasonable amounts of work. Um, she would screw up my schedule. She threatened to fire me several times. Crazy. And again, no, I'm not kidding. Not kidding. It was so bad. She bullied me so bad. And I'm telling you, I'm pretty tough. I have no problem saying that. But she bullied me so bad that I actually used to go to work with a Bible every day. Every day I brought the Bible with me because that was the only way that I could get through the work day without wanting to walk in her office and do something that would get me thrown in jail. That's how bad she was coming for me. She used to set up meetings for me and then I would come to her office and she would tell me, oh no, it's, it's canceled. Come back to me in 10 minutes. And I'd just be, so like, if you can imagine like a huge office, I'd just be zipping back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Nonsense. But I digress. So the reason for this I found out in time was because she thought I wanted her job as the talent acquisition director. Here's the kicker. I didn't want her job. <laughs> I didn't want her job. I actually wanted a job at one of the sites as a talent management person dealing with workforce readiness and things of that nature. I didn't want her job. Now, as a role model, as a mentor, had she taken one second, five minutes to ask me what my aspirations were, she would have found that out because I would have told her. It would have went something like this. Janine. So I see you taking all these certifications and you know, you're really ambitious and you're doing really well. You know, what's the end game? What do you really want to do? And I would have said, Director X, I won't use her name. I want to be a talent management director looking at workforce readiness initiatives within the organization at one of the site hospitals. Done and done. Could have saved herself all that time bullying me. Could have saved herself all that time going home, plot and trying to figure out how she can make my life miserable. Could have saved her a ton of time. And in the end, we went at it. I ended up leaving the organization. And guess what? Four months after I left, guess who got demoted? Miss Director. So... You know, like this, I tell this story to say like the toxicity, the jealousy, the conniving, that crap, we've got to get a handle on. Must, must, must get a handle on as women. It is the worst. In fact, I don't think, and I'll go out on a limb, I have never seen a man operate like that, ever. The only time I have ever had these kinds of issues have been when I've been managed or supervised by a woman it's never been by men men can be like men are just overtly jerks why is there so much fear I don't know it's almost like you would think that there's no collective so that's why I like I almost laugh sometimes when I hear the feminist thing it's almost like there's no collective like we're each just clawing our way to the top and it's like I got to the top of the mountain, mountain, you can't be up here, kick, kick, kick down the mountain, kick down the mountain, like, really, women, are... the whole, yes, and the fact of the matter is, when you're in a position to mentor somebody, or even if you're a leader, 
period. You have to expect that your day will end. That you, at some point you're moving on, you're doing something different, and this person's the one that's got next. Or it, I believe it's your job to identify who has next, whether they know it or not, and help them kind of hone their skills so that they can replace you. You should be happy. Wow, this is the person that's going to succeed me. I would be. You can't, first of all, you shouldn't want to be there indefinitely and you should want to be molding the next generation i mean i've actually everyone wants to be a man. right yep and some settings are worse than others i mean government for instance nobody leaves when i worked in government literally that the median age there was 55 I mean, that we had people like with walkers coming to work, just to come to work, not because they enjoyed what they did, not because they enjoyed the company per se, but are you laughing, but I'm being, <laughs> I'm just saying, just because. And meanwhile, there were like, you know, X amount of people sitting in the department, waiting, pining for the opportunity to move up one step. Not even several steps, one step, and they can't get there because these people will never leave. They will never leave. What do you do with that? You know, like somebody has to have next. They just do. It's nothing to be jealous about. It's nothing, nothing to be sad about. It's a transition. It's, it's cyclical. That's how this thing works. So I just never understood this whole mindset of I'm going to destroy you because, you know, somehow you're coming to take something from me. I, I, I don't get it. Um, and so, you know, I don't really know how they better pick women who aren't like this, but there's got to be a different way. Yeah, there should be forced retirement. I mean... It has to end at some point. I'll tell you how ridiculous it was at my last place of employment. It was so ridiculous that there were people that actually retired and came back and worked in our administrative pool. So I'm like, here we are. Imagine me, because I didn't really understand this phenomenon. Like I was really tardy to the party. So imagine me, I'm at this breakfast. They're like, okay, it's the last day for Susan, everybody. Let's clap for Susan. Susan gets her watch. Susan gets some crumpets and some tea and some hugs and tears are shed. And I'm like, wow, this is profound. This woman's had a great career, 35 some odd years. God bless her. I tell her all these things, you know, God bless, you know, enjoy yourself, enjoy your retirement. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I come back the next week and Susan's in the front waiting for orientation because she's going to work in another department in the admin pool. What? I'm like, didn't we just have a breakfast for you? Didn't you just get a watch? I told you, God bless. I don't know. So, you know, yes, to that point, there has to be a stopping point. I mean, not only is it, it holds other people back from being able to move up the ranks um but at the same token you keep things stagnant you know like it's one thing if these people are innovators in their own right and they just keep innovating and they're just a wealth of knowledge well those people hey as long as you're willing to work i want you but you know i'm talking about the kinds that are like oh this place sucks you know every day like there's never a good day never a sunshiny day they need to go Bye. To Kimberly's point, they need to go have a great life. Here's your retirement or severance or whatever it is and, you know, go in peace. But um, we have to do a better job when it comes to picking, you know, the people that are supposedly, you know, the ambassadors for the organization or just role models in general. Like, I just think you know, the people for me, at least, that I often want to model myself after are not the people that have the notoriety. Like, 
I couldn't give a rat's behind about Beyonce. I think she's crazy, stupid, talented. However, she's just not anybody that is on my radar. Now, for me, I'm more, I'm looking at like, you know, Dr. Jedediah, who is like, you know, the first African-American astrophysicist. You know, I'm looking at people like that. I'm looking at people like Maya Angelou. People of that kind of pedigree. Um, but, you know, in whatever it is, I just, absolutely, I just think, one, that role models are needed at all points in life. Like, I think sometimes we take for granted that in adult in adulthood that you actually need a role model. Like, I think people think, okay, I'm an adult. I've arrived. You know, I don't really need anybody to kind of model myself after. And so while you're not really in a modeling mode, you're still always learning. So for me, I don't foresee a day anytime soon where I won't be looking for that person either in business or otherwise to kind of watch what they do or to learn from. We can change the game. Absolutely. And so, you know, I just think they're needed everywhere. They're needed at, for me as a business owner, they're needed even if you're a 25 year, you know, veteran in your niche. I think they're needed there too. They're absolutely needed for children. Absolutely. I mean, my daughters, I kind of have a sense of who they like. I know what they watch. I monitor that closely. Um, but I certainly hope, I pray, I hope that they see enough of a role model in me that they don't have to look too many other places. I mean, that's the way I feel about my mother. That's the way I feel about most of the women in my family. They can obviously feel different. But I try to refocus them. I try to get them into what I'm doing. I try to get them to understand what I'm out here doing with my business. Women tend to feel wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, but here's the other thing. I think for even people like myself and people who are really, really seasoned, I think we just, we, you get haughty. You get haughty in a sense, like there's nothing more that you can learn from anybody because you've been there, done that. And I think that's a terrible way to be. I think you always need a role model. In fact, I can't remember where I saw it, but I remember seeing something that said, um, if you're like an older professional or whatever, more mature professional, that you should actually take a role model that's younger than you, not necessarily older. So they said you should have like an older role model, somebody who's where you want to be, somebody who is where you were, and then somebody like right at your level. So there was like three different role models that you should have. And I just thought that that was phenomenal, especially with the reverse aspect of it. Um, in terms of having a younger role model because you can learn from young people like I think people just discount that whole thing and think oh well especially now like there's just so much nonsense and banter about millennials and them being lazy and you know all of these things and it's like okay fine but you can't discount the fact that younger people just bring a fresh perspective they just do it's not that you're not hip like I like to think I'm hip and I know I am but you know there just is a fresher perspective and there's a different way of thinking about things and so I like to be around younger people from time to time and hear what are they thinking what are they doing what are they into because it gives you food for thought so you know I, I think there's just a little bit of arrogance um, on both ends. You know, there's this arrogance as you become a more mature professional in the sense that you think you've been there, done it all, and maybe don't need to hear or be able to see or learn from anybody else. And certainly there's some young people that, you know, think they know it all and don't need anybody to show them that either. And so there's some arrogance there too. But we are in desperate, desperate need of good female role models and there's some great women out there doing stuff like I mean great I mean even if I just think about like Periscope and 
um, you know, women that are out there, out in front, trying to help other women. You've got, you know, Pamela Booker. You've got Adia Rogers. You've got Christine St. Ville, just to name a few. Um, you know, there's Dana Garrison, who's out there, too, you know, doing stuff huge and giving back in a big way. There's just... There's a lot, a lot of good people, but they're not always the ones that are like in the shining lights. They're not always the ones with the notoriety, but there are women out there doing things. You just have to like, as I said, find what's right for you because I really feel like the person you pick has to speak to you inherently. Like there just has to be a synergy. As I mentioned with that one situation with me and that CFO, she was not for me. She was not for me. We have wild differences. Um, so, you know, definitely be open to finding the right person. But really, it just comes down to us holding ourselves at a higher, much, much higher level um, and bringing integrity back. Integrity, class, you know, like all those little things our grandmothers were exuded and talked about at a time that seemed to have gone away yeah we just need a little bit more of that and just a willingness to reach back and help another woman or grab another woman's hand and say hey i got your back like i get it i got your back i've been where you've been let me help you goes a long 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 way and I'm huge on that. Like, as long as I've been able to be in a position to mentor, I'm huge on giving back. I don't care if it's 10 minutes of my time to have a conversation, if it's not me helping other moms get their groove back. It's just a no-brainer. We've all been at a point where we didn't have all the tools that we needed. Oh, thank you, Latari. That makes me happy. Um, and I learned from you as well. See, just based on me having like this whole show, met Lataria through the show, we've had a discussion offline before. And like, you know, I would have never known what she was trying to accomplish if I had been haughty or selfish with my time. I was very, very happy to have made that time to speak to her, to understand what her goals are and what she's trying to do. And it's phenomenal. Like, let me tell you, she's a rock star. So like, it's just about that. Like, it's supposed to be a sisterhood. And I feel like at times it feels less and less like a sisterhood. And so I hope if there's anything that you take from this that you know, we just, we can do better. We're not doing the worst, but we can do better. And, you know, if you haven't had the opportunity to be a role model or to mentor somebody at some point, or if you've been thinking about it and thinking, you know, exactly, bring the sisterhood back. If you've been thinking about mentoring and you're like, uh, I don't know, do it. I'm telling you to do it. Like, you won't regret it. You'll never go to sleep at night feeling like, wow, that was a bummer. I shouldn't have done that. It's the best possible thing you can do for yourself and for somebody else. It's just a nice thing to do. So that's my spiel. And obviously you can watch this if you don't watch this on Periscope. All of them are always on my YouTube channel. So you can always check that out. What's going on on the blog this week? This week, I'm talking about the abuse of labor. You may want to check this out. Like, if you've ever been in a situation where, like, what you were hired to do didn't exactly match up with what you're actually doing, I actually break it down, like, in a fair labor standard standpoint. And it's actually based on a friend of mine situation, but I think you'll enjoy it. So if you've been through that or you know somebody that's going through that kind of situation, um, it's at the aristocracyofhr.com. Check that out. Next week is Hot Topics. So because it's the last week of the month and so every last week of the month, um, that Thursday, I always do hot topics. So I'm planning to pull some stuff out that you're probably not gonna expect me to discuss 
but we're gonna discuss it because we're adults and it's 11 o'clock at night on Thursday so we're gonna have fun that's just what it is and that is pretty much it I have nothing else going on other than it's going to be my birthday on Sunday and so for any of you who celebrate Easter just wishing you a really happy and blessed Easter I will be doing that and egg hunts and trying to enjoy some libations for my birthday and just reflecting on blessings and Lataria, thank you again. Um, and that's pretty much all I got. So thank you for joining in. Um, I can't remember the person that joined in in the beginning, but thank you for joining. Thank you, Kale. Thank you, Kimberly, on the assist. Thank you, Lataria. Have a great weekend and I'll see you guys next week. Bye.